Bom dia e bem-vindos. Good afternoon and welcome. Eu, Alana Camossa, vice-coordenadora do Lab China e pós-doutoranda no programa de pós-graduação em Relações Internacionais da UERJ, vou formalmente iniciar o quarto webinário do Lab China de 2023. E o webinário é intitulado A Guerra Russo-Ucraniana e as Escolhas da China na Ordem Global em Transformação. Eu vou trocar agora para o inglês, porque o seminário ele será conduzido no inglês, que vai ser, então, o idioma comum das discussões aqui de hoje. Well, I will formally start the fourth Lab China webinar entitled The Russo-Ukrainian War and China's Role Choices in the Changing Global Order. In this webinar presentation, jointly organized by Lab China and the Graduate Program in International Relations of State University of Rio de Janeiro, Professor Xiaoyu Pu will delve into China's foreign policy in the current geopolitical scenario. Xiaoyu Pu, Xiaoyu Pu is an associate professor of political science at the University of Nevada. He is a member of the Public Intellectuals Program of the National Committee on United States-China Relations. His research interests include China's foreign policy, East Asian politics, and emerging powers. He's the author of the book entitled Rebranding China, Contested Status Signaling in the Changing Global Order, which was published by Stanford University Press. I would like to thank Professor Xiaoyu Pu for accepting our invitation and for agreeing to share with us your insights on China's foreign policy and the ongoing war in Ukraine. I'd also like to highlight that in the seminar, we will have the presence of Professor Leila Dawood. She's going to act as a discussant today. Professor Leila is an adjunct professor at the State University of Rio de Janeiro and the current coordinator of the graduate program in international relations at the same university. Her research interests encompass international relations theory and international security with a focus on balance of power theory nuclear policy and non-proliferation. I would like to express my gratitude for Professor Lila's presence here today. I do think that we are going to have a very interesting webinar and I can imagine that some questions will arise in the minds that are the ones that are here today. So if you'd like to post some questions at the end of the debate, I will kindly ask you to post it in the comments sections and Professor Leila Dawood or I will be responsible for reading the questions for Professor Xiaoyu Pu. Well, without further ado, we are going to start with the presentation of Professor Xiaoyu Pu. Thank you, thank you again for your presence here today. Obrigado. <laughs> That's the only <laughs> a few uh, Portuguese I know. So it's my uh, great pleasure to share some thoughts on this topic. And the title of my talk is Russo-Ukraine War and China's Role Choices uh, in the Shifting Global Order. Uh, this talk draw upon uh, so, sort of my old research and also ongoing research, something old, something new. So I would draw upon some of my earlier articles and book, uh, some ideas from there, but also have an ongoing research with some colleagues on the current Ukraine war and China's uh, diplomatic uh, reactions to that. Uh, regarding the Ukraine war, it's really put China into a very much like a, a, a awkward position. Uh, on the one hand, China has always emphasized sovereignty, UN charter, and China has maintained good relations with both Russia and Ukraine, uh, but uh, the, a lot of uh, criticism about China's position, especially from the West, from the United States. So uh, even the State Department of the United States criticized China to be like a too pro-Russia. But from China's perspective, China think that its position is really balanced. Uh, uh, I mean, the Chinese uh, foreign ministry a few months ago uh, published this uh, white paper, lay out China's uh, foreign uh, policy position, uh, policy position regarding the Ukraine crisis. So try to uh, have a balanced position. But uh, from there, from here, we can see there's a clear gap between Western criticism of China's position and, and China's own sort of a perception of its uh, position regarding Ukraine. But uh, 
this is just one case of this kind of perceptional gap. The United States has increasingly uh, perceived China as a revisionist power, which has both intention and the capability to fundamentally challenge the West or also challenge the uh, current international order. But, but China largely uh, uh, thought that this was, this is a misperception. So during the multiple sort of uh, summit uh, discussions, summit meetings between President Xi Jinping and President Biden, uh, China, the Chinese leader always emphasized that, quote, the US side has misjudged and misread China's strategic intention. That means regarding China's overall strategic intention or regarding China's position uh, over the Ukraine crisis, there seems to be some kind of gap between how the United States or the West understand China's position uh, or intention and how China understands its own uh, position and intention. So this actually reflects a bigger uh, uh, a bigger question. What kind of role uh, does China want to play on the world stage? How does China think or rethink its status and the role on the global stage? So in my earlier book, I argue that China is in the position, in the process of rebranding re itself on the global stage. Rebranding means repositioning. Uh, the Chinese word, zai ding wei, uh, the efforts to building a new image for a company or a product, that, that, that's a business concept. But the Chinese uh, uh, analysis, a lot of Chinese scholars increasingly debate about China's roles, what kind of role China should play or can play on the world stage. So actually since 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, the topic about the foreign policy position or repositioning uh, has become a very much a hot topic in China's foreign policy community. Even internationally, it's also uh, a hot topic. Uh, Professor uh, John Eckenberry, uh, more than 10 years ago, he argued or suggested that, quote, China is in critical respects, the swing state in world politics. That means a lot of global issues, politically or economically, China's choices will shape the fundamental direction regarding a lot of issues in global politics. So that, that's the sort of the background of our discussion today is that what kind of does China want to play uh, on, the, on the world stage? So the Ukraine crisis, or the Russo-Ukraine war triggered to some degree this kind of rethinking or debates about China's roles, both in China and also abroad. So, so I, I will talk about some bigger picture overall about China's roles or role choices in the changing global order, but also using the, the Russo-Ukraine war as a case study, uh, how these particular crisis or international conflict further trigger the debate or discussion or rethinking of China's role choices. Uh, also, uh, many years ago, uh, I co-authored a paper with Professor Randall Schweller uh, called After Unipolarity. In that paper, we conceptualize that China potentially have three choices. Number one, China could be a spoiler or, or challenger. That means China will delegitimize the existing global order and replace it with something entirely new. So this is sort of like a more confrontational, competitive approach versus the United States, versus the West. The second option, China could be a supporter. That means China will be, will be winning to take a greater responsibilities and contribute more to the existing order. Put, put simply, uh, this would indicate that China almost like 
like a, a bigger Japan again, a bigger uh, economy. So the third option for China is that China could be a shirker. Shirker means China prioritized domestic growth uh, while shirking from taking greater responsibilities. So the third option means China does not want to confront the West, but does not uh, want to contribute more to the existing order either. So those are our sort of typologies uh, we conceptualized 10 years ago. In recent years, I rethink in this kind of framework. I'm thinking like it, in Xi Jinping era, maybe there could be a, a false option as beyond a, a challenger, supporter, shirker, China could be a potential co-leader. Because obviously, uh, if uh, in, the, in the Jiang Zemin era or Hu Jintao era, China sort of uh, tried to be, uh, uh, to take a low profile, uh, low profile in global affairs. But Xi Jinping has obviously conducted a much more active or proactive, some people say even assertive uh, global diplomacy. So it's hard to say that China is shirking in all respects. So in this, uh, in this context, maybe a new potential role China might uh, play is this kind of co-leader. I mean, co-leader means China try to contribute more to uh, dealing with a lot of regional and global challenges, primarily through multilateral framework. So this uh, is some sort of like a, a bigger framework about China's road choices. But uh, if we think about why uh, does China want to, 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 to play different kind of role, in China, there are all kinds of debates, discussions, different ideas, and uh, this is, all, this is also related to the shifting global order, uh, the shifting global order. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, uh, useful framework. I borrow some ideas from Dr. Henry Kissinger's framework. He emphasized that for any global order, we need to focus on two factors. One is power, the other is legitimacy. So Dr. Kissinger emphasized that, quote, every international order must sooner or later face the impact of two tendencies, challenging its cohesion, either a redefinition of legitimacy or a significant shift in the balance of power. Uh, international legitimacy means some sort of a set of commonly accepted rules that define the limits of permissible action. So Dr. Kissinger suggests that international legitimacy is very fundamental when we evaluate international order. It's not about domestic legitimacy, but primarily about some fundamental rules of the, of the games, fundamental norms in international system. So if an international order is a largely legitimate legitimate order have some kind, some kind of legitimacy, this does not mean uh, great powers or major powers in the system. They don't have some sort of tension or problems with each other. But if an international order is legitimate, that means we don't see some fundamental conflicts because fundamentally major powers have some minimum consensus about norm, uh, international norms and in international rule of the games. The current uh, international order, I think uh, why there we see all kinds of tensions, rising tensions. If you if borrow Dr. Kissinger's framework, we see that both, fact, both key factors, power is shifting, legitimacy increasingly, there is not enough minimum consensus among major powers regarding international norms and our international rule of the games. That's problematic. So re regarding uh, distribution of power, uh, in our earlier articles, we suggested that the, the power of the distribution of the power in the system is deconcentrated 
So in the process of deconcentration, and in the process, rising power also started to delegitimize some aspect of the existing order. And particularly in terms of distribution of power, uh, there are all kinds of discussions nowadays. Is that a still a unipolar system, multipolar system, or bipolar system? Uh, my own opinion is that the distribution of power increasingly is a bipolar system between the United States and China, but it's a asymmetrical bipolar system. That means the United States is still more powerful than China. But, but both the United States and China are much more powerful than other major powers. Uh, but again, this does not, this is just the distribution of power. This does not mean other major powers like India, Brazil, uh, and Russia, they cannot have uh, play a significant role. Those other major powers can still play a very important role, but the, 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 the key power distribution is still more like a bipolar system rather than a unipolar or, 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 or multipolar system. So that's the first sort of power is shifting. Uh, as power is shifting, a normative uh, uh, order that means the ideational factors in the international order are also shifting. So even, even during the global financial crisis, some American experts uh, noticed this uh, emerging trend, like some uh, some days people no longer believe that the alternative to the Washington-led order is chaos, as the rest of the world has no fear about experimenting these alternatives. So uh, the Chinese elites nowadays, they are talking about the East is rising, the West is declining. That be has become a popular sort of uh, 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 words, popular sort of uh, 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 narrative in China, although in reality, we should mention that the, the notion of the East is rising, the West is declining, is also very controversial or, or even debated in, in, in China. But again, as power is shifting, the normative preferences in the international order is also shifting. Of course, we, we have seen non-Western powers have played a more, much more active role uh, from G7 to G20 now, G20 obviously is more significant uh, than G7. The emergence of the BRICS and China led AIIB and, uh, and BRI, uh, right? So all these new initiatives uh, indicate that long Western powers try to uh, play a much more active role in, in a global shifting global order. So get back to the the core uh, topic of China's road choices. Uh, I argue that when when talk about China's road choices, China really uh, has multiple identities. China is a socialist country. It's a regional power in Asia. It's a one of the major great powers, uh, and also it's still emphasizing its developing country status. And uh, some people. Uh, uh, also uh, increasingly use uh, superpower to describe China. Although I should emphasize that the notion of superpower is, uh, is like a very controversial in China, in a sense that the Chinese officials, the Chinese government have never formally used superpower to describe China's current and a future international status. Although international media, international scholars increasingly use uh, superpower status to describe China's potential uh, in the future. But also China is uh, facing multiple audiences while dealing with its role choices, uh, including domestic audience, a regional audience in Asia, the global South, obviously, and also the West. So these different audiences sometimes have uh, different, uh, even competing expectations 
regarding China's role uh, on the global stage. So let me highlight uh, uh, one particular, that's the, the dichotomy of China's choices between great power status and uh, developing country status. It's kind of puzzling why China as a rising powers sometimes also try to downplay its uh, right, growing role on the world stage. So I want to just give you one illustration. This is uh, some sort of a uh, tension between uh, sort of the tension between great power status versus a developing country status. So over the past 10 or 20 years, China has invested a lot of uh, projects, programs from Olympic games to a new aircraft carrier project. All these uh, uh, indicate China really try to play a great power role. Partially, this is also for domestic consumption, not just international. Like when China hosting Olympic games, I mean, when, when China, when the Chinese government showcase all their sort of uh, achievements, uh, a big part of their audience is at home, uh, not just internationally. But also, uh, I, I, in my book, I even used the, the notion of conspicuous consumption. So to some degree, a lot of programs, China's programs, try to symbolize its great power status. It's almost like uh, um, a, a young lawyer's luxury car. So it's kind of a status symbol uh, through conspicuous consumption. But also China sometimes also try to uh, symbolize its great power status through conspicuous giving. So a few years ago, uh, uh, leading Chinese experts, Dr. Zhuan Zhongze, uh, an expert uh, uh, in China's foreign ministry think tank, uh, where he described China's role in the six party talk dealing with North Korea nuclear crisis, he said, quote, China has been the convener and host of the six party talk. We Chinese provide a free meeting room, free coffee, free drinks, free cookie. We have made great effort. Uh, that's to some degree a little bit hilarious, right? Oh, how good, what, what, it's a little bit like, like a joke. But I think Dr. Ren ha had an interesting point. He, he wanted to uh, demonstrate that to some degree, the Chinese government has increasingly, uh, has, has, has some sort of uh, stronger willingness to, to, to provide international public goods through multi multilateral forum either dealing with regional crisis or dealing with a, a climate crisis and other issues. So China is not always a shirker anymore. Sometimes China is willing to, to provide some public goods through multilateral forum. So that means through that way, China could demonstrate its great power status. So, but on the other hand, it's interesting is that China still, in many occasions, emphasize its developing country status. My own observation is that there are typical three reasons why China emphasizes its developing country status. Uh, number one is a shirking, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, by emphasizing developing country status, China tried to avoid taking unwanted responsibilities uh, in, in, in regarding some issues. The second uh, motivations for China is solidarity. China wants to demonstrate its solidarity with the global South. Uh, that's also can, can continue to be important part of China's motivations. The third is reassurance by emphasizing China is still a developing country, uh, is a, still a developing country, China wants to emphasize it's not an emerging threat to other, to its neighboring countries and uh, to the West. So whether that kind of narrative is persuas persuasive or not, that's debatable. But uh, my observation that for the foreseeable future, China will continue to emphasize its developing country status. If we get back to our original question is that how about the Ukraine crisis, right? The Russo-Ukraine war. 
what kind of role China wants to play in this kind in dealing with this, this particular urgent and a significant uh, international crisis or conflict. I argue that China has some sort of contradictory role choices. Uh, officially, China, the Chinese government or Chinese officials often emphasize two types of role. On the one hand, uh, China emphasizes it's not a, a party or, or, or a part of the conflict. So it's Chinese officials often emphasize that it's a real conflict between Russia and the Ukraine, indirectly between Russia and the West. China is should not be blamed for this crisis or for this conflict. So there, Chinese officials, their emphasis is try to avoid to, 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 be, to take a unwanted responsibilities. So that's a kind of shirker narrative. But on the other hand, uh, China also sometimes indicate its willingness to take some um, some sort of more proactive role. Uh, like uh, President Xi Jinping sent his special envoy uh, to, to Russia, Ukraine, and some European countries uh, earlier this year. And China wants to, to, to play a sort of like a mediating role whenever possible. So in that sense, to some degree, if possible, maybe China wants to be a co-leader in dealing some of these uh, big crises, including the Ukraine uh, crisis. But I should emphasize the mainstream official positions, my own observation is somewhere between shirker role and co-leader role. But within China, there are uh, foreign policy experts, intellectuals, Papa, uh, opinion shapers, uh, opinion uh, leaders in China. There are also different kinds of uh, ideas. Some people strongly support Russia because they think that the United States is ultimately the major rival. So, so in, in that sense, they are advocating that China should join Russia and pursue a totally like an anti. Uh, West anti-US agenda uh, pursue that kind of approach. That's sort of like a challenger spoiler role. And but on the other hand, there are some Chinese intellectuals. They completely or strongly support Ukraine, and and even to some degree support the position with the West. And they argue that Russia is absolutely losing the war in a larger sense that. China should uh, should really join the West in in even uh, in in, I, in sort of distance itself from Russia as much as possible. So so that's kind of like that kind of narrative is still uh, still exists in China. So and uh, so overall, I think uh, regarding road choices. Uh, China's real choices in, in the Russo-Ukraine war, there's also, a, as I mentioned, a huge gap between perception and, and expectation in the United States, in, in the West. So US, maybe some uh, European officials, uh, primarily see China as a challenger or spoiler uh, in the crisis. But ultimately, some of their narrative expect China to be a complete supporter, uh, like a completely support the Western position regarding the crisis. So I think that's a kind of huge gap there. Another potential gap I would argue is that uh, this kind of uh, narrative versus policy gap. That means uh, that means uh, China's narrative or propaganda is more pro-Russia than China's actual foreign policy behaviors. So that's another uh, potential gap, yeah, p -p potential gap. Let me uh, explain a little bit more why it's the case. Is that China's media narrative, um, why there, to what degree uh, 
China's media narrative has this kind of strong pro-Russia buyers echoing Russia's talking points throughout the, the conflict, blaming the United States and NATO entirely, downplaying the war atrocities uh, in Ukraine, and promoting some like a conspiracy theory originated from Russia. So these are like, if, if you check China's uh, media narrative, it's pretty like as much like pro-Russia. But on the other hand, if we carefully examine China's actual policy uh, position or policy behaviors, it's it's a little bit much, it's, it's, it's much more nuanced and much more careful. So like, for instance, China's media narrative has all this pro-Russia uh, position, but it, China's foreign economic policy uh, really uh, very prudent. China has not, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, Chinese uh, companies, um, uh, uh, chi uh, ha ha like uh, largely comply with Western sanctions. Um, and uh, China has not provided like any missile weapons uh, to, to, to Russia. Although there's some news coverage talking about maybe some Chinese companies, they are selling, selling some equipment might have dual use purpose, both civilian use and military use. But that's a little bit more sort of complicated issues. But overall, China's economic policy is that try to maintain normal uh, relations with Russia uh, as much as possible, but it does not violate uh, 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 Western sanctions in economic transactions. Number two is that uh, even China's media coverage is more pro-Russia, but uh, China's diplomatic approach is more prudent. Uh, China tried to balance its various considerations regarding the uh, uh, crisis. And even Chinese media earlier uh, in the crisis promote some conspiracy narrative, but the Chinese officials have maintained a very ambiguous position. Uh, uh, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian, initially, he, he uh, sort of, uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his, one of, one of his uh, speeches, he mentioned about the conspiracy narrative uh, regarding some bio lab in Ukraine, but interesting enough that uh, Mr. Zhao's, uh, uh, he's a, uh, as a spokesperson, that particular speech, the English transcript was removed from Chinese foreign ministry. Of course, uh, uh, Mr. Zhao was very controversial as a spokesperson. He was removed from his position earlier this year. So my, my point is that this, despite, uh, despite sort of uh, China's narrative is a little bit pro-Russia, especially media narrative, but of China's official policy is much more prudent, uh, uh, including its economic policy and its diplomatic approach regarding the Ukraine uh, crisis. And a, a, a brief explanation of the gap regarding narrative and policy, uh, national leaders, Chinese national leaders, foreign policy officials, they, they are facing the pressure of, of multiple international audiences, including uh, Russia, including the global South, including the West. They must, be, they must carefully calculate uh, their for, formal uh, foreign policy position. But China's media, uh, uh, media professionals, propaganda officials, uh, media editors, they are motivated by domestic forces uh, including consideration of political sensitivity and about domestic nationalist sentiments. So in recent years, given US-China tension, anti-US sentiment is rising in China. You can imagine uh, uh, so sort of popular sentiment has this kind of pro-Russia, pro-anti-US uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, 
orientation. So the media narrative to some degree uh, accommodate some kind of domestic uh, preferences, but internationally, China's uh, foreign policy position must be much more careful. So let me summarize uh, my point is that the first uh, conclusion is that is China really challenging the US or Western led international order? It's kind of complicated. Uh, I would argue that China's role choices are still contested both domestically and internationally. So potentially regarding the Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, China's uh, uh, mainstream official position is somewhere between a shirker role and uh, and um, and a co-leader role. But uh, in a broader sense, uh, there could be a more extreme version of anti-West narrative, uh, some kind of like a spoiler challenger role. But there are also uh, some intellectuals in China talking about a much more pro-West. A position, the opposite of the other side. So I think the government position is a a, a little bit more prudent than the the the, the uh, sort of uh, uh, expert communities or intellectual uh, circles. But uh, but again, uh, regarding China's role choices, uh, are still pretty much contested. The second regarding the. The earlier question, can China still be a swing state in world politics? The dominant Western narrative already puts China in this kind of like a anti-West club. Uh, but I would argue that within China, maybe the real uh, position is much more nuanced and complicated. Deng Xiaoping in 1980s, he talking about the fundamental problem in world politics is peace and development. Peace, that's the East versus the West. Development, that's the global South versus global North. Professor Wang Jisi, one of the most influential strategic thinkers in China, many years ago, he wrote an interesting article. He talking about East, West, South, North. China is in the middle. Uh, at that point, his argument was that ideally the best position for China is in the middle. Uh, China is somewhere between the, the global south and the global north. And China is somewhere between east and the west. Ideally, that's the best pos possible position for China. But of course, I know in recent years, given the rising tension between the United States and China. Whether that's still possible, I, I think maybe it's, it's debatable uh, right now. The third point is that, again, is there still room for debate in China or on China? In China, I mean, uh, uh, political discussions, policy debates in China. On China, I primarily mean in the West or internationally because uh, uh, because internationally, a lot of people say China's intention is clear. So uh, the debate about China's intention should be over. That's a lot of narrative in Washington, D.C., talking about China as a revisionist power. The debate about China's intention should be over. But uh, this is also related to China's domestic politics. A lot of people say, given China under Xi Jinping, uh, President Xi has concentrated his power, right? Nowadays, how could be there any like a debate or discussions on any policy issues in China? Everybody should just follow President Xi's guidance. That's over. That, that, that's it, right? There is no debate. But my own personal observation uh, over the past one years uh, regarding the Ukraine crisis that, I mean, the, the, the Russo-Ukraine war, uh, it's a very polarized, it's a very much a polarized topic in China, both at elite level and, and also at societal level. So one of the news, if some colleagues can read the Chinese, I, I can translate you the story. Last year, 
uh, the the initial uh, stage of the of the Ukraine war, uh, two retirees in Shanghai, uh, they had a, like an argument in in the public park uh, about uh, the the Ukraine war. So one retirees support Russia, the other retirees support the Ukraine. Then they had a street fight. In the end, the winner. The winner went uh, went to the jail, and the the loser went to the hospital. So that showcased just vividly how polarized the topic could be in in Chinese society. At at the uh, elite level, at least a lot of uh, foreign policy experts they are he he heavily debating about this topic in the past few months. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, interesting discussions uh, going on there. So I would argue that even uh, even nowadays, uh, there are still lively debates regarding uh, a lot of policy issues, especially foreign policy issues uh, in China. Uh, even uh, President Xi has consolidated power. China is not uh, like a unitary monolithic actor in international affairs. So we still need to pay attention to a lot of nuanced voices uh, in China. Uh, my final point quickly is that in terms of foreign policy implications, especially for the United States and for the West, is that the United States should have a much more accurate understanding of China's intention. And the West should have a more realistic and a limited goal while pressuring China during the uh, Ukraine crisis. Don't expect like China to, to, to exactly share the same position with the West, but also don't pu push China further to, to, to Russia's position. So China, there's still some sort of uh, uh, flexibility how the, the United States, how the West should deal with China regarding the ongoing uh, Russia Ukraine war. So uh, let me stop there. I look forward for your, for your comments, suggestions, and look forward to your questions and our discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shangfu. Now I will I will ask Professor Leila to initiate the debate. I was I just wanted to say that I have been following your work in the last few years and it was really interesting to hear your talk today. And Professor Leila, the floor is yours. I'm just trying to uh, understand how to unpin Professor uh, Poole. I try to do so. Is it possible that you stop sharing the screen, Professor Poole? Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you listen? Uh, do you hear me? Is it okay? Okay. Thank you so much. I'd like to start uh, by thanking Alana for the invitation. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here engaging with Professor Poo. Thank you so much for your lecture. Uh, Professor Pu, I was I was wondering if we could talk a little bit both about your talk and your work uh, since uh, you uh, in your uh, speak in your talk you mentioned some some of it or some of your work. Uh, and I'd like to start by talking a little bit about status and an interesting concept that you proposed recently. Uh, I, I think it's an art, it, it is proposed in an article uh, about India and China relations. You, you talk about a status dilemma, right? And you mentioned that um, you modify a little bit Professor Wolfer's uh, uh, definition of, of the idea of status dilemma. And you yourself sa say that, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that it's a little bit like a security dilemma whenever, uh, and the security dilemma is the idea for us in IR that when you maybe seek defense, it can be uh, misperceived and misjudged uh, as an offensive move. 
and the ad, it can uh, uh, end in an uh, uh, in offensive uh, undertakings by the other side, right? And you said you say that the status dilemma is has a dynamic that can be similar to a security dilemma. Uh, that maybe one side wants status not at the expense of the other side's status, but it can be misperceived, misjudged, mis uh, uh, as as uh, a competition. And the end result may not be uh, uh, peaceful, right? So uh, based on the, this idea of a, a, that I would like you to explore further, if, if, you, if you may, uh, I would like to uh, propose the following thought. Uh, is, it, is the role of a co-leader available for China? And I'm basing this question on your own definition of a status dilemma, right? Because I think that maybe uh, this role is not available for the simple fact that any move to gather status, especially in the current crisis, may be perceived by the US or misperceived by the US and the end result won't be a positive one. Uh, so the, the 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 idea that I would like to also propose or to, in a sense, uh, challenge you, co-leader with whom, right? Because I think that you could be a co-leader. Uh, you could imagine uh, China and Russia as co-leaders, right? But China and the United States as co-leader, maybe not. Uh, you could imagine that there, there isn't a dilemma, a status dilemma between China and Russia, but probably there is a status dilemma between China and the US, right? So those would be the first questions. Co-leader with whom? With the US, with Russia? And is it available? Is this role available for China. Uh, the second uh, thing that I would like to ask is uh, more, uh, it's not necessarily connected to status uh, and status claims, but to the material results that the war uh, may have for China, uh, the concrete results, right? Uh, and uh, I I always think, not that I like Professor Meshima that much, but I always think about the strategy that he says is available for great powers, which is bloodletting. And it seems to me that maybe something not doing much in the case of China and letting both sides bleed, Russia and the West, will lead to beneficial concrete results financially and military for China. So I would like you to de develop a little bit further on the concrete results of the war uh, for China financially, and also uh, in regard in relation to its relationship to Russia. And there are some uh, scholars that say that the end result might, might be that Russia will be the junior partner due to uh, Russia's uh, growing uh, dependence on on China, right? Uh, another uh, uh, discussion that I would like to uh, propose is uh, signaling, as, and and maybe you could, we could uh, one could say that it's status signaling uh, in the terms that you yourself. Uh, uh, develop uh, is when when you when you say that uh, not necessarily necessarily uh, China is a spoiler. Uh, maybe there are some instances that it can appear as such that the country appears as such, right? Uh, and 
if if we engage with the the current, for instance, relationship relationship for, of China in BRICS in the BRICS, uh, in the, uh, BRICS, BRICS group, and the the recent expansion, uh, how does the in the uh, membership membership of Iran sounds to the international and Western audience, right? Uh, how do that uh, engagement with Iran within BRICS uh, resonates with the idea of status signaling and the idea of not being a spoiler of the current system? What's, what would be your thought or your thoughts on that um, issue? Um, the, the last question that I would like to propose is how do you uh, view the defense relations between China and Russia? Uh, they are sure not engaged in a formal military alliance, but they are certainly uh, cl closer to each other in the sense that they have formal agreements, uh, that uh, they have uh, military exercises together. So there are uh, some activities in defense uh, related areas that suggest that they are not an alliance, but they are uh, maybe closer to external balancing that they once were. So how do you evaluate this relationship in not only politically, but in a military sense? So those would be some of my questions to Professor Poo. And I, it's a pleasure to, to be here. And thank you very much for the opportunity once again. Okay, uh, I, I respond first, then we open. Okay, good, good. Thank you, Professor Dawood. I think your your questions are very thoughtful. I, I think uh, all these are very important, very thoughtful questions. So I try to uh, uh, briefly answer. I, I, I should confess, I don't have like a good answer or perfect answer on, on, on any of them, but try, I think, I think it's, it's, all these questions are really big questions. I think uh, it's it could stimulate a lot of uh, 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 further discussions. First, regarding like uh, China's potential co-leader role uh, with whom, uh, whether this role is available, especially regarding uh, like uh, assuming status dynamic is real uh, between China and the United States. Uh, so, so my my answer is like this: is that number one, uh, even even uh, we assume I, I do think that some kind of status dynamic between U.S. China uh, is real, and uh, but 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 still, from the U.S. perspective, uh, there's always a kind of trade off. Uh, uh, the the United States, despite uh, increasing rivalry competitions uh, with China. The U.S. policymakers still want to, to sometimes uh, ask China to take greater responsibilities like climate change and other issues. So that's from Obama administration. That was maybe even more obvious. But now, given competitions up and front, sometimes people forget about the other side. Actually, for a long time, U.S. policymakers uh, uh, has always encouraged China to play a more active role. It's just in recent years, the competitions become more salient. People forget that the rationale from US perspective is to ask China to share greater responsibility, take greater burdens. So I think regarding the Ukraine war, I noticed that the earlier narrative from US officials uh, were much more negative regarding China's role. But in recent uh, months, I noticed the, the narrative is, uh, I think, uh, gradually shifting in a sense that to some degree, if, if China can play some kind of positive role, that should be largely welcome even by the United States. 
Second, I think from China's perspective, even they recognize competition with China with the U.S. is so intense. But China has a rational incentive to win some kind of support with from Europe. So China really care about the European reaction. So Europe is very European elites and the public are very angry about China's uh, position. Uh, so I think from China's perspective, China really sometimes try to distance itself to some degree from Russia, partially to accommodate, even we, we, we think about, oh, they, they largely give up the United States, but they still want to win uh, some kind of diplomatic cooperation for, from Europe. So I think given that, I think uh, the co-leader role is still diff difficult for sure. I, 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 I'm sure it's, it's difficult, but I think in principle, uh, it's still possible in, in, in some sense. So the second question is regarding the material uh, implications of the war for China. I understand the the, the realist argument, uh, like uh, me, me, both in U.S. and China. Some people would say, of course, let's uh, let the from China's perspective, just let the war continues. Then the West will be distracted. Russia will be weakened, uh, and that's uh, sort of ba based on balance of power politics. That might be good for China, but that's one perspective. But uh, in China, I have also heard a, a lot of alternative perspective. Number one, so there are some both economic and the diplomatic foreign policy reasons why China wants to end the war. Number one, China has suffered a lot uh, from the war economically. I mean, Ukraine was a key com component of China's BRI project in Europe. So this really damaged to some degree China's BRI uh, in, in a big part of, of Europe. And also China's economy has also suffered uh, because of the, the the ramification for global economy. But the second, I also want to say is that even we only calculate foreign policy and the diplomacy, the war is a liability uh, for China it, 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 diplomatically. The United States, the mainstream idea in the United States is not a soften its position regarding China. Actually, uh, the United States uh, has a, has sort of like a continue its competitive posture against China despite the uh, the, the the distraction. So so strategically, uh, this does not dilute U.S. strategic attention from China. But furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, this has become a huge liability for China to to maintain relative good relations with Europe. I think uh, Chinese policymakers realize that if the war continues, there is no way China could maintain a, a better relations with Europe. I think, of, again, for a lot of reasons, I mean, there, I, I can understand this kind of uh, pure power politics calculation, but I think in, in practice, in foreign policy, economic practice, China has rational incentives to end the war earlier. The third question regarding signaling, or status signaling, so whether this kind of spoiler role or challenger role, uh, whether China can avoid that kind of image, uh, especially regarding the recent BRICS expansion. So I, I should say that that's exactly, I think my point is that uh, China's role choices are contested in a sense that some of China's, uh, for even ideally, the rational position for China is to play a either shirker role or co-leader role. But uh, some parts of China foreign policy uh, behaviors might give the outside uh, uh, observers an impression is that China is organizing an anti-West club, right? So, but I would think uh, 
it's it's more complicated because 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 even the the BRICS expansion, uh, maybe China's calculation is more complicated. Like a, like for China, the, the the there's a debate whether BRICS should be further expanded. That means the whole group will be become larger, uh, potentially, presumably, diplomatically more influential versus the West. But uh, problematically, not just about this might uh, signal a kind of anti-West uh, uh, impression, but uh, as, a, as the group become larger, uh, the group will become more inefficient to make decisions. So I think uh, even in China, there are all kinds, some kinds of debate, but ultimately maybe the first uh, 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 voice uh, temporarily win the debate for this particular issue. But I still think for China, even BRICS expansion, the primary purpose maybe is not to organize a coherent anti-West club, it's try to expand the collective voices of the non-Western powers. I think that's the major goal. But, but the, the real effect or impression, maybe some unintended consequences could be more complicated. I understand like a country like Brazil and India definitely have more reservations about BRICS expansion, right? So I, 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 understand, I, I, I understand that kind of uh, uh, concerns, but I think that Sometimes uh, uh, China's signaling is uh, is could be contradictory. Sometimes could be com com very complicated. This number four question: How we understand the defense cooperation between China and Russia? Uh, so I I think number one definitely true. China and Russia have deepened their defense cooperation in the past 20, 30 years, since the end of the Cold War. China has purchased a lot of weapons from Russia. Uh, but uh, but uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, because a lot of reasons. But on the other hand, I think there are still important limitations. Uh, the strong relations between China and Russia is not a military alliances. Number one, because both China and Russia want to maintain strategic uh, strategic autonomy. That's still very important. So China does not want to be entrapped into a conflict just because of Russia is trapped in a conflict. I think Russia does not want to be entrapped in, in China's potential conflict either. So that's different from US military alliances with Japan, with NATO countries. I think that's still very, very important. Number two is that China's foreign policy position is very careful. Russia officials criticize Ukraine like they have some sort of extreme, like a negative narrative talking about Ukraine government as a not new Nazi regime. The Chinese officials have never used that kind of narrative to describe uh, Ukraine domestic politics. So there are some limitations that both China and the United and Russia they understand. They want to build partnership, but the partnership is different from uh, sort of unlimited uh, sort of uh, military alliances. Yeah, let me stop there. I think all these questions are very important. Uh, I just provided some sort of tentative answers. So, so thank you again for your wonderful questions. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Leila. Thank you, Professor Shavipo. Uh We have some questions from the audience. I would just like to to check if someone wants to pose a question directly. No? Okay. So we have two questions from the audience and I also have one question. Uh, the first question is from, let me check again. It's from Marcelo Azevedo. China currently has four of the five largest, largest banks in the world by assets. And how could this change the balance of power. So the person wants to understand how the China having four of the five largest banks in the world would change the balance of power. And also we have one more question that was posed by Eduardo Fantini. 
Earlier this year, China released its position on the Ukrainian crisis and presented 12 points. One of the points refers to abandoning the Cold War mentality. So the Eduardo wants to understand how do you see and analyze this position regarding the four role choices for China to follow in the new era? And also, I have one question regarding the domestic audience. I know that you decided, you talked a lot about it in your presentation, but usually when we start learning or studying about China's foreign policy, and especially China's foreign policy decision making, uh, it's not that clear for us, it's not that clear for us to understand the decision making process. And at some point, I I was wondering uh, about the domestic audience that you said that has some views that are pro-Russia and so on. And I was wondering if the domestic audience at some point uh, wouldn't pose some pressure to China's foreign policy decision making, right? So I was wondering why uh, we do not see that much of the Chinese authorities maybe controlling the pro-Russia uh, movements in the Chinese media and how and if at some point the domestic audience can pose a threat, I would say like that, for the China's uh, decision to stay in the, I would say, I wouldn't say in the middle. Uh, yeah, we can say at some point in the middle, but not say like pro-Russia nor pro Ukraine or something like that. That's are the questions that I have. Uh, that's it. So we have okay. three questions. Okay. Yeah. The first uh, about uh, whether China has some of the largest banks, whether that that uh, changed the balance of power. Uh, let me see this. Uh, the evaluation of power is so fundamental in international politics, international relations research, also evaluate US-China balance of power. But this is most complicated and a controversial topic to some degree, is that power is so, it's, it's so easy, but it's so hard to measure, right? Power could be uh, resources, power could be relational, but also power could be structural, structure. So, so in, in some sense, if we see power as resources, China's power has grown dramatically in the past 20 years, right? Uh, now China's like GDP uh, by purchase power parity is already larger than the United States. By exchange rate is uh, is about 70% uh, of US. So, so you, you, China has huge manufacturing capabilities. China is the largest uh, trading partner for more than 100, year, uh, 100 countries, right? So if you if you think about power as resources, China is very, very, very powerful. Uh, to some degree, catch up with the United States in various indicators. But on the other hand, if we, if we evaluate power in a much more comprehensive way, think about the power as, as a structural power, who control key financial resources uh, like US dollars uh, 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 versus the uh, Chinese currency. Uh, you think about uh, the, the, the capability to shape international agenda. I think if we think about power like that, I think the United States is still more, much more powerful than China. So again, depend on how we measure power. So if, if we only count money, Maybe China is much more powerful than we conventionally might assume. But if you think about power in structure, it's a structured power, it's a structural power, uh, depend on agenda setting capability, uh, the, the key financial power. I mean, I think regarding a lot of these kind of dimensions, the United States is still more powerful than China. Regarding uh, China's like uh, the, the 
uh, political position on the Ukraine crisis, especially criticized the Cold War mentality. So I should emphasize that a document is very comprehensive. Uh, that's really summarized China's most formal uh, government position regarding the Ukraine crisis. So my understanding of that, that, that the government document is also have some, some sort of different components. Some components definitely indicate China is willing to play a more active role in dealing with the crisis. Uh, but the other components, China emphasized is not a direct part of the conflict. Uh, there, China wants to distance uh, itself. So I, I, overall, I think that that uh, my own interpretation is that that document is very nuanced, uh, very prudent. But again, uh, initially, some people talk that's a peace plan. But that's that that document is not a peace plan because it's not a, like a, a sort of a, a specific. It's just to summarize some general principles of China's uh, position. Uh, it does not offer like any concrete uh, position, a concrete uh, sort of uh, proposal how to really solve the problem. I think that's the uh, that's the uh, Chinese uh, government document regarding. You, the Ukraine crisis. The final, the third question about the domestic audience uh, pressure uh, and the, whether the Chinese government really control pro-Russia uh, uh, pro Russia opinion. Uh, so uh, so my, my sense is that uh, uh, number one, regarding the foreign policy process, uh, the, I, I think uh, even though public opinion is is important in any country regarding political regimes, but regarding China, the public opinion, the role of a public opinion is indirect in Chinese case. Unlike the uh, maybe unlike the United States or Brazil, maybe public opinion could directly shape election. Right in China, there is no competitive election. So public opinion role is much more indirect uh, in China. So in that sense, I think um, there's some kind of more, more sort of interactive processes between uh, the government position and the public opinion. So public opinion is largely shaped by government propaganda to some degree. So in that sense, so even my own argument is that China's uh, uh, government position is relatively balanced. So I'm not saying China's position is absolutely neutral. So some scholars say China's, uh, uh, China's position is pro-Russia neu neutral. So in a sense that it is still a little bit pro-Russia but it's not as pro-Russia as some people think. I think that's the so in a sense that the but the because of the propaganda because of other factors the pro Russia opinion is much more salient than than the real than 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 Chinese government real position, right? Let's just uh, 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 just talk about okay. Assuming China's position is like a uh, like a sixty percent pro Russia, forty percent on, on the Ukraine side. That's government position. But the, the public opinion could be like 80% for Russia, 20% for Ukraine. But uh, what I have, my, my observation is that in some sort of, among some intellectual or foreign policy experts in China, it could be the opposite. So it could be like more experts maybe support the Ukraine position. Uh, only a few experts support Russia's position. It, it could be done like that. So it's much more complicated picture than we conventionally might assume. Yeah. So uh, there is another question by Leandro and it regards the relationship between China and India. And uh, uh, 
he uh, it's a long question but uh he uh, narrates the tensions between india and china and he asks how much are these tensions reflected in BRICS, and are those perceived by its uh, other members BRICS members as potential uh, as a potential weakness to BRICS? and he thanks you so the 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 let me let me so the question is uh the section how much these tensions reflect breaks all these perceived by its other members as a position of weakness. So the what's the weakness? Why is the weakness uh, of, of the breaks? Because of, because breaks because of Russia or oh, the tension between China and India. Uh, that's the uh, part of the weak weakness of the breaks. Is that the question primarily? Yeah, he asks if if uh, the tensions between China and India uh, pose a weakness to BRICS or determine oh, yeah. I yeah. weakness. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That's exactly, of course, that's exactly uh, a big problem for BRICS. Uh, it, it, unlike G7, uh, right? So G7 is much more coherent. Uh, Western liberal democracies, all industrialized, countries. So BRICS has much more diverse political, ideological, even geopolitical preferences. So, and the China and Russia, China and India have severe tensions, especially regarding territorial disputes. It's so hot. My own research also indicate that the status dynamic, status competition, uh, some sort of in additional hurdle between uh, uh, in Indian-China relations. So these, to some degree, limit the potential of the BRICS. But on the other hand, I should also say is that maybe it's this also indicates the sort of some kind of key feature of BRICS. From the very beginning, BRICS is not a coherent group. So, but, but the BRICS countries also, to some degree, celebrate the diversity, in a sense that they, 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 they might claim that we are so diverse, but we can still cooperate whenever possible. And also, the, the to some degree, the BRICS grouping can also mitigate uh, China-India tension. So I think the BRICS uh, group, group offer another important platform than the Chinese leaders and Indian leaders then they can talk and mitigate their, at least manage their tension. I think that's another important point, despite, of course, uh, China-Indian tension limit BRICS, but the BRICS is a diverse group from, from the very beginning. I think, I mean, after the last round of expansion, uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia will be new members. These are two, long-term rivals. So that's also uh, another testing moment, whether BRICS can survive this kind of diverse group, right? In, in such a diverse uh, uh, context, yeah. Well, I think I think there, there are no more questions. So I would like to thank Professor Shavipu and I also would like to thank Professor Leela Wood for the debate today. I certainly learned a lot and I do hope that we can continue to these discussions in the future, maybe in person, maybe in Brazil, maybe in the United States or in another international event. And thank you, thank you again for listening and please do not forget to follow Labishina on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel to rewatch this webinar and to stay updated uh, on upcoming events. Thank you again. And thank you. Good night, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.